Hello, good afternoon. This is Julie Moore, and welcome to today's session on Raising the Bar on Service Quality. Um, today we're going to be looking at the problem management process and the types of metrics that would help us to not only manage problem management, um, but also to drive value as those uh, improvements that are created through problem management manifest themselves uh, within the business environment. So a little bit about myself. My name is Julie Moore, as I've said, and I am the president of Mind the IT Gap. I'm a published author. I do a lot of speaking around the globe. Um, and I have been working as a consultant since uh, 1999 in the service management space, um, primarily around service operations and the processes within service operations. And I consider myself to be a, very much a domain expert within um, you know, incident management, problem management, um, and those processes that are touching the customer contact point the most. Um, I am an ITIL expert in V3, as well as an ITIL uh, service manager in V2. Um, and I'm a graduate of Ohio State with a bachelor's of science degree uh, within computer science. Let's kind of think a little bit about what happens within an IT organization that really helps to drive quality within the environment? When we look at incident management, incident management is very much like um, a Band-Aid would be, right? It's something we do after something has already happened in order to provide value to our customers, right? Answer the phone, help to resolve the issues, um, and restore service as quickly as possible. But when we begin to think about problem management, Here's where we have the opportunity to identify the root cause of what's happening within the environment, identify what needs to be changed, implement some sort of a change so that we can see an improvement in the overall quality of the services. Now, most of what problem management does is reactive, right? We're waiting for something to occur within the business that would trigger an investigation from IT staff to identify the root cause and eliminate that. But there's also a very important side of problem management that is proactive, where we're looking at and analyzing data that is captured in the environment in order to find things that, that kind of are festering underneath the, the surface of what's happening within IT with the goal and objective of eliminating those things before they actually become visible to the customer or um, in, in the example of seeing an error on one system, we might also want to be able to prevent that error from populating across similar systems that we may have within the environment. So we really do have the capability within problem management, and it's linked to incident and change, to be able to identify things that can be improved and really increase the quality of services end-to-end -end within an IT organization's uh, infrastructure. And I can't think about uh, too many things that provide that type of value to the business, right? The service is already live. We've spent all the money to invest in it and get it into the environment, and it's not working the way that it should. So here's where we have the opportunity to kind of meet the expectations that the business had as we went through the design of that service and prior to implementation. In today's session, we're going to be looking at uh, just some quick overview of some trends within problem management, the benefits of problem management, the process flow um, as it was uh, released in the 2011 edition of the ITIL framework, and then we're going to talk a little bit about value contribution. Now, I put this into the presentation because it's very important to understand that problem management has to have a holistic view of the process itself for measurements to be successful. So I briefly wanted to talk about, you know, what that problem management is supposed to be doing, what it should look like, and how it can contribute value. Then I have identified some measurements that have come from a variety of different sources where they have kind of looked at the problem management process and identified um, the types of metrics that we can use within problem management to generate value. So we're going to start with COBIT both version 4.1 as well as the um, 
5.0 version that's currently um, just being uh, piloted kind of in the environment at the moment. It's not actually been released. We have ITIL version 2 as well as uh, the, the newest edition that was released uh, in August. And then I have some measurements from Gartner, which are really looking at the relationship from incident to problem to change. Um, and then probably some resources that you may not be aware of, something called the uh, Problem Management Best Practice Handbook. Um, there's also a standard that came out of the Government of Ontario and a process guide and some other uh, kind of resources that I've identified that may be helpful to you in identifying the types of things that you'll want to measure. But the key here is to understand what we can measure, right? What is possible out there? What should we be measuring within problem management? Then you can take this list of metrics and look at what's possible to measure into your environment and develop your own set of core metrics to drive the problem management process. So if we were kind of looking at the ITIL seven-step uh, improvement process, Really, this presentation is really around step one, what should we measure? From that point, it's up to you to develop your own set of metrics, what you can measure, and to create a presentation of that information that's meaningful for your particular audience. So we'll look at, you know, just briefly, I mean, this, this presentation wasn't meant to be about a balanced scorecard, but we will kind of talk about what types of metrics from problem management could fit into those four perspectives. But again, it's up to you to identify the metrics that you'll be able to manage to put in or measure to put into that balanced scorecard. So I, I found some of these quotations uh, to be quite interesting. 73% of failures in infrastructures are attributed to software and servers. Um, and of course, we know that because if we look at a service end to end, a lot of times when we try to figure out the failure, what has actually gone wrong in an end-to-end -end service, it can be the application, it can be the OS, it can be the network. It's often extremely difficult to find what is causing a particular problem in the environment, and often this requires a cross-functional group of the organization, which means more cost, right? The more complex the infrastructure, the more potential complexity in, in identifying the root cause, the more resources that we're going to need to help us to identify that. So identifying and correcting it is actually a huge challenge for many organizations, and this is predominantly due be to the complexity. We haven't done a very good job of managing the way that systems have been integrated into our infrastructure. So what ends up happening is, it, you know, we have a, a tremendous amount of interfaces between databases and systems and in web servers, we have uh, you know reporting linkages across different types of, of databases. There's so much complexity driven from the infrastructure itself that we've kind of made it harder on ourselves to identify the root cause of what's what's happening within the IT organization. So where do we begin? Um, I think it's best to think about. Uh, what is the ultimate objective of what you want to do in problem management and, and what the measurement is meant to drive. But really, we need to tie what we're going to do within problem management to the goals and objectives of the organization. And I, I can't think of many organizations out there that aren't interested in improving the quality of the services to create a lower total cost of ownership, reducing the cost of delivery of those services, and reduce the risk that the organization, not just the IS organization, but the business faces. So when we look at problem management, we can affect all three of these, right? If we reduce the amount of downtime, if we reduce the amount of errors, we're reducing cost. We're also increasing quality and availability and making our customers happy. Now, as far as uh, compliance and risk is concerned, when we eliminate errors in um, our, our products and services, we're better able to manage risk. We're also measuring the right things to help us identify risk. So there's a lot of value that comes out of problem management tied to risk management within organizations. So the processes within operations, problem management, change management, asset management, and of course incident management are very integral to affecting these three things within the business environment. Now, what is the benefit to the business of, of problem management? And I start here 
because if we can clearly define how problem management is going to affect the business, then we're going to be better able to identify measurements that help us to understand if we are creating this type of beneficial effect in the business environment. So improvement of the quality of the infrastructure and of the services, reduction in the number of incidents, fewer issues with business services, higher levels of availability, getting rid of those repeat incidents, which is, you know, a huge thing on customer satisfaction uh, when the things continue to happen and the, the business gets very frustrated with us because we can't make these things go away. Um, and then the last one, better insight into how we're using IT services from the reports that are being generated from problem management. So, again, measurements that contribute value to the business are all going to be tied to where we can make the biggest impact and improvement within the business environment. Now, internally to the IT organization, we, of course, get a tremendous amount of benefit, and I, and I think it's almost um, – even more value, if, if that can be said, than the business would get because we're able to better understand the customer experience, more quickly diagnose things that are happening within the environment, get the service back up and running by helping incident management, creating better stability, eliminating errors in the infrastructure. All of that takes a lot of work and effort. And, and when we can eliminate things, we're basically making our workforce that much more efficient. We're able to go off and do other things than working on the same things over and over and over again. Ultimately, higher availability, higher quality, and improved image of IT. And I don't know about you, but being able to really have the business recognize that we are improving and that the products and services that we provide are improving is a great value add to the IT organizations, definitely for morale, um, you know, trying to focus on delivering that value for the business. A lot of times, this is a benefit that we don't think about and we don't measure very often, but when we do problem management, we're actually learning as an organization because we're kind of picking apart our infrastructure, and every time we do that, we learn something. So problem management is a great way to keep our skill sets uh, fine-tuned for us to learn about new things. Um, and it should also be a very a strong focus within the process to make certain that we maintain the skill sets that are necessary to do the types of root cause analysis that are required. Um, if we're doing problem management well, we're going to have an impact on the service desk and incident management, which, again, you know, if we think of it as a Band-Aid, not having to have that Band-Aid or at least how often the, the, the end users are actually calling in, if we can reduce that, you can see how that has a, a general impact on the service desk's ability to really have an impact on solving those things that require um, someone to do some analysis to, to, to view it versus the repetitive things that keep happening. So when we do problem management right, we have better organizational communication, um, we have better identification of problems and errors, uh, quicker uh, diagnostics in order to figure out what we need to submit to change management for RFCs, we have clear communication of workarounds, incidents, problems throughout the business and with, uh, within IT and the customer. So there's a lot of tangible benefit from having a robust problem management process for IT as well as for the business. So what's the objective of problem management? You know, I'm, I'm certain that we all kind of have an idea of what problem management is meant to achieve. But defining this for our organization and what we want to accomplish is important because if our metrics are going to tie back to our objectives, then we need to, as a group, define what's the objective of problem management in our organization. It, you know, we can look at the ISIL definition, we can look at the COVID definition, and we can come up and use those word for word out of the book or we can apply problem management to affect the types of changes that we're looking for within our organization, whether it's reduction of high-impact incidents, you know, whatever it is that's tangible for us, the things that we need to eliminate in the environment should be built into the objective so that everybody agrees. This is what we're trying to achieve, and we're going to be measuring toward the success of generating that type of change in the environment. So these are the common things that are usually expressed as objectives minimizing impact of incidents and problems, 
minimizing the duration of outages, managing problems within some sort of a, an agreed time frame within service level management, you know, like mean time to restore service, service or mean time to closure, uh, different types of metrics that look at the outcome of the process, um, reducing problems, preventing problems or incidents, doing trend analysis. A lot of times if we put this into our objective that really it's not just reactive, we want to say we're going to be doing trend analysis as part of the proactive side of problem management and setting that as an objective is probably a very good thing to do. Um, we need effective root cause analysis to do pr problem management correctly um, and, you know, really ultimately an outcome of problem management is for us to maximize productivity of resources. But there is this part of problem management where we are um, uh, categorizing and prioritizing the, the things that are occurring in the environment and applying the resources to the things that, the, that will create the greatest amount of value for the business. So that's also part of the priorities of problem management. And then finally, automating uh, whatever we can uh, within the process using event management. Okay, for I have a question saying that uh, someone does not have audio. Um, I am not actually able to know if you guys can hear me. Uh, so if someone else is having problems with audio, I guess the only you're not going to be able to hear me say this, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of you out there can actually hear me. Um, so that's the process objectives of the uh, problem management process. Now here is the high-level flow coming out of uh, the ITIL uh, 2011 version. Okay, good. Thank you, someone, for providing that to me that you guys can all hear me. Um, and this is, again, um, just a little bit of variation on what happened in the version 3 uh, problem management book. But what we do see a lot of value in the new version is um, a lot more definition around proactive problem management, a lot more definition around the known error records being created, um, so if you haven't had a chance yet to view the 2011 syllabus for uh, problem management, it is definitely an improvement, something that I, I had identified as, you know, I, I really wish we could make some improvements here, and they've done that. So there's a really good value add in at least getting service operations book in the 2011 edition. So notice here we have detecting, logging, categorizing, prioritizing, investigation and diagnosis, the identification of a workaround, which is, of course, going to go to the incident management, when we find these known errors and we have the workarounds, we raise the known error record, we do the resolution, um, sometimes by submitting a, an RFC to change management, we close and do the major problem review. Now, again, this is the high-level process diagram for problem management. And, of course, the value of looking at this is that we have metrics that should tie to the activities in the process. We have to understand if the process itself within the activities is performing and if the outcome is creating the value that we want. So we have to come up with a process flow. Yours may look exactly like this, or you may have slight variations depending on the types of technologies that you have available to you, but you definitely want to identify the process steps within your problem management process using the tools that you're using because measurement is very critical within each of the activities in the process. Okay. I just got five questions here. I wanted to make sure I got to everybody. All right. Now, I took a uh, methodology within the software development um, environment, and I said, okay, if we're measuring the development process within software, which, by the way, often deals with errors and eliminating those errors, how could we apply that as a, pro a measurement strategy within problem management? And I think there's a lot of parallel between something that's driving a software um, development process and what we see here for problem management. We need our measurement strategy to be driven by business goals, to have a clearly defined problem management process and set of activities to meet the needs of all the different stakeholders. So a process owner, their you know, needs are going to be different than someone who's trying to demonstrate value to the business. So it's very important for us to identify the stakeholder and the types of measurements that are valuable to those different stakeholders. We want to measure in the process and as well as a result of the process. 
look at the full life cycle of problems. So from the time they're initiated either through event management or incident management or from suppliers all the way through to closure, that that entire uh, life cycle of the problem um, is a very valuable thing that we should be looking at and evaluating. We also, we saw at the very beginning that when we do measurements, one of the important things that we need to do is to create reports that are meaningful for those stakeholders as a means of communication throughout IT. If we're making an impact in problem management, that's a great way to champion and throughout the organization that, hey, we're getting better, we're improving the quality, and we need to be able to demonstrate that. That's why the reporting mechanism of this is equally as important as the measurement. Um, we definitely want an aggregate across the life cycle, and we want a structured measurement process. So that's kind of out of the scope of what I'm covering here. We're really trying to identify valid metrics to the process, um, but I wanted you to understand that you need to kind of build in these components into your measurement strategy in order to be successful. Now, this came out of a, a book around managing risk, and I thought it was kind of important to just make this tie back to risk management from a problem management perspective. IT can create a lot of value for our customers by improving the products and services, improving the way that we get from, you know, the time that they come to us with an opportunity and the time that it takes us to get to market as well as quality. When we think about value contribution, right, being able to identify where we create value. Increased quality is a huge thing that problem management has an impact on. So value creation, quality of services, is probably one of the most important things that our business covets, right? That's what they want. They want the services to work the way that they're supposed to work. So when we talk about making uh, something tangible to the business about how we're creating value, Quality services is probably one of the most important things. Um, not only does it lower costs, but it definitely increases the, the customer satisfaction of the, of the IT organization. All right, so now the next couple slides uh, are not going to take us very long to go through. My goal is not to sit here and read to you all the different metrics that are available out there, but to just kind of expose you to the views that are coming from different frameworks within the industry on what can be measured or what should be measured within uh, problem management. And we're going to start here with COBIT. And COBIT is right now in the exposure draft of version 5. So this is not a, uh, an approved release of COBIT as of yet. It's going uh, through some revisions. But I definitely, it's, it's a, a leap from the 4.1 version, and I couldn't sit here and talk to you about COVID 4.1 without at least talking to you a little bit about what's happening within uh, version 5. So one of the things that comes from COVID is this idea of, you know, we need to measure in the process and measure outside of the process. Now, the, the, the metrics within COVID are designed in a very particular way to show that the activities are driving value to the process outcome, the IT process outcome is driving value to IT to match with their goals and objectives, which then can be linked to business processes. So being able to show that linkage is part of what COBIT provides in its control framework. It's a very valuable control framework when we, when we begin thinking about that value contribution to the business. So if we look at COBIT, these are the metrics that come out of COBIT 4.1. You'll notice here that we have metrics that are very much tied uh, down here in the bottom uh, uh, right-hand corner. We have metrics that are tied to the activities in the process, which drive towards the process goals. And the process goals have measurements that are down here in the center box in the bottom row, which then drive towards the IT goal which we have measurements in the bottom left-hand box that show how we're tracking towards the IT goal. Now, that's a very important linkage if we can just show um, when we're looking at the measurements that we're going to create that we have this distinct link between, hey, I'm measuring the activity here, but my goal is really to show the value that it's going to create at the IT level. So I have a question here. What are the specific roles, according to best practice, that the service desk should play in the problem management process? Well, I think 
from uh, the perspective of this particular um, lecture that I'm doing here, it's kind of a little bit out of the scope. But I do want to say that the service desk is the key place where we're going to identify problems and be able to trigger into the problem management process and provide effective data into that process to help feed root cause analysis. The second part of this, what are some tasks that the service desk should be accountable for? Um, I think I just kind of talked about that, clearly identifying what the problem is, feeding the data in, and I'm going to get into some KPIs that do focus on the relationship between incident, problem, and change. So I'm hoping that that answered your question there. All right. So this is the type of relationship that we want to see with our metrics. We want to see I'm measuring the activity, and I can translate that into value at the IT goal level or at the business process level. And you can feel free to go to ISACA's website to download the COVID 4.1. Um, it will, you know, provide you some visibility into what those metrics are. Now let's take a look at the way that this is expanded into COVID 5. What they've done, and I'm only showing you a portion of the metrics that they're talking about from problem management that are going to help drive value to the business. Managing risk, being able to identify problems that occur in the environment that were not identified in a risk assessment that actually attributed to risk or business-related risk is one type of measurement that can help us when we talk about managing risk at the business level. We talk about business IT alignment, the number of disruptions to business services because of problems, um, the percentage of stakeholders that are not happy with the service levels that we're providing, um, satisfaction on the quality, again, alignment to the business. When we measure things within the process, we want to be able to show this alignment to things that matter to the business. Um, te technology integration, this is where kind of about the, the um, complexity of the environment that I was talking about earlier. We have incidents caused by integration errors, uh, business process changes that have to be reworked because of integration issues, um, program delays or extra costs because of integration issues. So COVID is recognizing in version five that there is a significant amount of disruption that occurs because of managing the complexity of our environment and creating the integration, not just between systems within IT, but also into the business processes. And when this occurs, this is something that generally takes longer to solve, it's harder to find the root cause, so being able to minimize the number of incidents and errors and problems that occur because of integration is another uh, value contribution from a COVID perspective. Um, now this one I, I added in here for one of the metrics only that are listed here, of course, quality in the first one of management information, but the second one, incidents caused by non-availability of information. You could easily just, you know, say that problems caused by non-availability of information is another thing. Now this one, to me, is a very difficult metric to check uh, or to track. But not being able to solve something because we have lack of information, um, you know, that's a, a pretty good thing to be focused on. That's an input into the problem management process that I think we should be tracking. Do we have the right information to solve the issues that we are facing within an IT organization? Um, and here we have compliance. Uh, many organizations are, are being held accountable from a, cl a compliance perspective by laws or regulations around information that is stored on the systems that the, that the business is using. So anytime we have incidents or problems related to compliance, not being uh, complied to policies, um, people not understanding those policies, um, people not supporting the, the policies that we have in the environment, um, you know, through their daily work practices, um, these are things that are central to the cause of becoming compliant with laws and regulations. This is much about the people doing what they're supposed to do as it is about people gaining access to information that they shouldn't. So here's where we can uh, show some value when we can identify when we have non-compliance of processes and procedures within the environment. And again, a lot of times these are going to come out of incidents or problems within the environment. 
Now, here are the, the last remaining uh, metrics from COVID-5, and these are all related to problem management itself. And here's where we begin to get into some workload analysis. These are probably very common metrics that you've seen or are maybe using today. Percentage of problems that are logged. Um, this one is around proactive problem management. Uh, workarounds defined for open problems. Again, that's going to help with incident management. Uh, how many times we get major incidents where problems are, are identified and logged. Recurring incidents because of unresolved problems. Again, that gets back to is problem management doing what it should do as an outcome in order to reduce the number of recurring incidents? And then the final one here, the number of problems for which a, a satisfactory resolution of that root cause has actually been found. So these are what I would consider to be more outcome-based metrics, things that we can't measure until the process is completed, along with a, a couple of workload uh, uh, measurements where we're counting how many times something happens as part of the process. All right, so COBIT, very much focused on compliance, very much focused on value creation, has a very unique set of metrics that you can see the transparency from what we're measuring up to the value that is created for the business. Now, ITIL, especially in version two, um, is very much focused on process efficiency and effectiveness within the problem management process. So we have kind of a, a different view coming from the ITIL framework. Uh, this comes from the version two. We have general metrics around the number of problems by impact, by category, number of known errors, mean time to closure, uh, temporary resolution actions, um, the number of RFCs that we create, uh, the impact that those have on availability and re reliability of the components. And then here we see, as the question asked earlier, a tie to incident management, number of incidents uh, that are happening during problem resolution, impact of those incidents before the problem was closed and a known error was confirmed, and uh, the, you know, the number of preventative and temporary actions that we're able to provide to incident management. So what we see here is much more focused on workloads, much more focused on the activities within the process, not as much on the value creation and, and connection back to the business. Um, here's where we see um, the link for problem management. How often are we giving status updates to the service desk on problems, giving them the information proactively on workarounds? That's a very important linkage because if the service desk is going to focus on incident um, restoration, they need uh, reliable information coming from problem management. So it makes sense to uh, have some sort of measurement on the linkage between the service desk and problem management on that communication. And then from an IT management view, again, looking at from an IT goal perspective, how much time did we spend in diagnostics, uh, the turnaround time to close a problem, and then looking at uh, resource utilization and, um, you know, how much time and expectation for any unresolved, that's kind of the open aging problem report, uh, something that kind of indicates, okay, we still know we're dealing with investigating these three things and we have, you know, solved these others. It would be just kind of a, a report that would indicate workload um, that was still out there that had to be addressed. Now, there are a lot of metrics that come out of V2 that are around quality. So uh, avoidable downtime from incident prevention, that's a great metric that attributes back to quality of the service and can also track back to value to the business. Um, average time to resolve escalated incidents. Um, and again, getting back to the question earlier, what kinds of things can we measure that help this relationship with incident management and what can we do? Um, some of these metrics will have to be measured within the incident management process in order to understand how effective problem management is. So some good metrics there. Now, from a 2011 version of ITIL, we, we begin to see this emphasis on we have a critical success factor, something that we have to have for problem management to be successful, and then some KPIs that are attached to that value creation. So I'm not going to read through all of these. Um, these are widely available to you within the ITIL framework. Um, but, you know, critical success factors, again, we see this value creation, minimizing impact to the business. We have four KPIs for that one. 
We have maintaining quality of IT services through eliminating recurring, and we have three KPIs that would indicate that we're, we're achieving that particular goal. Um, provide overall quality and professionalism and problem handling, and again, lots of metrics there tied to that value creation from an ITIL perspective of value of problem management. Now, I have some Gartner measurements here, and these are a little bit different. And again, depending on what you need to focus on, whether it's the tie to incident management, whether it's the tie to creating value within the business, you need to be able to pick the appropriate metrics that are going to help you. The ones that I found from a Gartner report are much more focused on the relationships between incident, problem, and change management, those inputs and outputs that come across those three processes. So if you have all three processes today and they're not working as effectively as they could together, some metrics that would be helpful to you in improving that are around quality. So we, we start getting into um, the ratio of incidents to problems to RFCs. So being able to create that link between, okay, we have this many incidents that are linked to this problem, that are linked to this request for change, begin to draw visibility into the linkage of incidents, problems, and change that life cycle to the point where we get structural resolution. Um, so the critical success factor is effective integration with the other processes and accurate assessment of the change. So did the, the resulting RFC actually eliminate those incidents and problems that we were hoping to get rid of in the environment? So there's metrics focused on incident problem change. Um, here's one that I think a lot of organizations go after because they want to improve the way that change management is working, and this is the number of uh, incidents related to a particular change. If we can minimize that, then we can uh, improve, obviously, um, you know, the, the downtime that's happening as a result of change. So if you're suffering from that one, again, measurements around that relationship would be valuable. Um, incidents associated with, or excuse me, uh, uh, here we're looking at the incident calls that were logged according to the RFC. So once the RFC has gone through, we want to clearly identify how many incidents were um, connected to that RFC and communicate that because that information is very valuable in, in helping to improve the quality of the change management process itself. So these are quality measurements, again, very much related to problem management, but looking more at the incident problem change life cycle and the quality that can be generated through that process integration um, being improved. Now, the remainder of these are probably going to be less commonplace for many of you. This one comes from the, the Problem Management Best Practice Handbook. Now, these are broken down by key performance indicators, and we haven't seen necessarily these metrics uh, in, in any of the other ones that we've looked at yet, but number of CIs that have a high uh, number of incidents or problems or known errors, these are great places for us to focus our root cause analysis and especially proactive problem management in order to get rid of faulty uh, configuration items within the environment. Number of problems raised, number of known errors, we see a huge amount of these are workload uh, measurements. Um, and then number of major problem reviews completed, that's an outcome-based metric. And these are, are more, again, to guide the process itself. They also recommend a certain number of reports. Remember, we talked about at the very beginning identifying your stakeholder and having the appropriate reports being uh, communicated to those appropriate stakeholders. So here are four typical types of reports that we could use. Number of problems, known errors, logged, quality, rejected. This is more of a, an output of the problem management process, probably going to improve the, the process itself. But when we get into backlog log details, these are things that we may want to submit to higher level management that will help us to get the resources that are necessary for us to uh, get the appropriate resources both for problem management and proactive problem management. Um, some more reports. Now we're getting into more do we have the right resources to manage problem management? Are we doing the process correctly? Are we uh, holding the appropriate meetings? Are, what, what is the effect of auditing the process? Um, financial information, again, very valuable. Just depends on what stakeholder group you want to kind of focus on, what types of reports are valuable. Again, 
these are just lists here for you to kind of get an idea of what is possible out there, um, and we'll feed into the last part of this particular presentation. Now, this is a standard that comes from uh, Ontario, and they have broken down their metrics into workload, which I have mentioned before. This is where we're counting and creating percentages of problems and known errors. Then we have process effectiveness, which is really around um, understanding uh, the relationship between problem, incident, service level, um, and, and incident management and problem. And again, these metrics will help us with the value creation that comes across that extended incident management life cycle. And then we have process efficiency, where we're driving the improvement of the problem management process. This was probably the cleanest, most uh, what I would consider to be a um, simple set of metrics that focus on three areas that will generate value. So if you're just beginning your me measurement process, this framework would be a great place to start. Again, you, have, you look at what they're, they're advocating should be measured, and you can identify what you can measure within your environment. Now, the process reengineering uh, guidebook gives us process measure measurements. Again, this are very much focused on workload. We have reporting, uh, daily turnover reports of all problems. I think that's a very uh, significant value add when you're developing your, your overall problem management measurement uh, strategy. Weekly reports are on the number of problems that are solved and giving that to the help desk. This is very valuable. Um, again, getting back to that question that we had earlier. And then how many problems are actually being resolved by level two, showing the relationship and the value that's being created by the different support partners that are helping with problem management. Now here are just some other measurements, and I found a couple that I really liked. I didn't take them in totality, um, but I wanted to show you some other ones. Uh, open problem reports, these are very much activity-based metrics. Remember I told you identifying what's happening within the process, open problems, incidents resolved by known errors, incidents resol resolved by a, a knowledge-based solution, incidents linked to problems. We're actually counting and looking at and trending over time how the interface between incident and problem management is working. And then we have a, a couple metrics there that are tied just to the problem management process. Next up, we have outcome-based metrics. Um, availability is a very important metric. We, we may measure this as part of availability and tie it to service level management, but I guarantee you problem management has more impact on availability than anything else because if we get rid of those root causes and we fix things permanently and we trend and look at where we have potential other issues, we're going to increase availability, and a lot of times that's going to be measured within problem management. Mean time to detect, mean time to repair, mean time to close. So we kind of... We're looking at that whole life cycle. How long does it take us to figure out that something's gone wrong? How long does it take us to actually repair it? And then how long does it take us to follow up and close and get rid of um, that particular uh, problem altogether? Those are kind of three time frame based metrics that are very important to us understanding how effective the process is in moving through the different activities and getting to the outcome. Some more activity-based metrics, and these, I believe, were produced by Pink Elephant, um, and it's getting into, you know, configuration items, incidents that are linked to problems. Again, a very good set of metrics around uh, relationships between processes. Okay, and I think this is my final one here, um, and what I liked about this particular list was the identification of what's helping us um, uh, from a are we improving problem management over a trended period of time? So it's not just a point in time measurement, but we're specifically looking at backlog, the number of known errors that are created over a period of time, the number of problem records created over a period of time. And what we're hoping to find out here, especially as you begin implementing problem management, that 30, 60, 90 day look, have we been getting better at identifying problems? And then over a period of time, as we reduce problems and the problem management process has had an effect on quality, we should see that trend then decrease because there aren't going to be as many problems in the environment. So these time-based metrics that are meant to be trended over a period of time also very valuable in showing the long-term effect of problem management. So kind of wrapping up here, we're almost at the time where I'm going to go be going through the questions. Um, 
But now you've seen all these different methodologies for measurement from COBIT where we see the linkage to the value creation in the business and ITIL where we're looking at critical success factors and KPIs within the process and Gartner where we're looking at incident to problem and change. You have to develop your own set of metrics. The things that are tied to objectives that you want to achieve within your problem management process. If you're just starting out, a couple workload-based metrics, some process efficiency and effectiveness metrics are perfect. Creating a balanced scorecard is kind of, as we move through maturity, being able to demonstrate to different stakeholders the value of problem management. And I think problem management, even more than uh, incident management or change management, can demonstrate a balanced perspective of value that it creates for the business. So remember, we want business goals attached to IT goals, attached to process goals and activities. We can see that transparency in the COVID framework. The balanced uh, scorecard wants to see from those measurements what's creating value for the business, what's going to impact how much we're spending and the, and the redu reduction of cost from higher quality of services, what are we internally, how are we getting better? You know, the, the efficiencies of leveraging our own internal resources are perfect for that internal process uh, perspective. And then learning and innovation. You know, how are we uh, improving our knowledge as an organization, getting better at problem management, getting better at understanding our infrastructure? I think problem management ties to the four perspectives of the balanced scorecard um, in a very valuable way. So we want a high-level view of the value that the process is, is, cre is creating, metrics that can be used and trended over a period of time, and we can also change those measurements based upon the current needs of the organization. So I hope I've provided you uh, with a, a, a good amount of information um, for those different perspectives. And I'll finish up here with just this last view. We have financial management, uh, financial around cost of problems or known errors, the, the generation of a higher level of profit for the business, customer perspective is tied to satisfaction, reduction in service breaches uh, related to problems, internal process, there's where we get the workload analysis and how we've been able to eliminate problems over a period of time, and then learning and innovation. When we can reduce the mean time to restore service, that means we're smarter, we're getting better at identifying root causes, and we're actually improving ourselves as an organization. So just to kind of wrap up, I've shown you a variety of different measurement uh, methodologies from different uh, kind of frameworks and standards and some that you may not know of. I think I've given you enough information here to help you go out and look at what makes the most sense for our organization to create that balanced scorecard. But don't forget, it starts with having a well-defined problem management process, a clear defined objective, so that where we're going with our measurements can be tied to uh, that objective. And that's it for today. I really appreciate everybody coming and listening to the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.